So, welcome everyone. My name is Thomas Vergo, working for Pax. I uh, would like to warmly welcome you to this webinar, focusing on understanding business activities related to illegal Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories as a major human rights problem. Uh, and this webinar will also present ways to end the complicity of Dutch and European economic and political actors with the settlement economy. Uh, three subtopics will be discussed today. First of all, the UN database regarding business activities related to the settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory. Secondly, lack of transparency on trade relations with the settlement economy. And thirdly, public procurement in the Netherlands of goods and services offered by companies that are part of the settlement company, economy. Uh, this webinar is part of a series on current developments in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, organized by four Dutch organizations, Oxfam, Novib, Pax, SOMO and the Rights Forum. And we are very happy uh, to see so many of you attending and also to have uh, so many distinguished speakers today. Uh, so first of all, Maha Abdallah, International Advocacy Officer at the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies, at the Brussels office, and she was previously working for El Haq. Uh, we have David Kettenberg with us, Canadian educator, journalist and activist. Valentina Azarova, International Legal Academic and Practitioner and visiting academic at the Manchester International Law Centre at the University of Manchester, and Giovanni Fassina, Director of the European Legal Support Centre, um, as well as Pauline Overeem, Senior Researcher at SOMO, and Gerard Jungman, Director of the Rights Forum, who will both provide short introductions to each of the subtopics I mentioned. Uh, before handing over to Gerard uh, to kick off the webinar, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, so this webinar will be recorded just to make sure that we can put it online also people who can't join today can still be watch it uh, and while we start the uh, the webinar with the presentations of the speakers followed by a q a at the end we do encourage you to already type questions in the q a box uh, so we can collect them uh, also the chat function is open uh, so in case you have questions uh, or want to uh, discuss your, your thoughts or share your thoughts with other participants definitely feel free to use that also if you have a question for us feel free to use the chat box um, and i also would like to mention that the opinion of the panelists is not necessarily reflecting the opinion of the organizing organizations uh, enjoy the webinar and here after over to you Thanks, uh, Thomas. It's uh, great to be here this afternoon or morning for others like uh, David. Um, my name is Gerrit Jonkman. Um, I'm the director of the Rights Forum. Um, I'm happy to introduce uh, first the, the, the first one of four excellent speakers on the three topics, uh, Maha Abdallah. Um, as Thomas mentioned, uh, Maha is um, a legal researcher and very visible in um, advocacy um, at this moment at the Cairo Institute and before at Al Haq. Um, like uh, Maha, uh, Al Haq, Cairo Institute, uh, many others, uh, the Right Forum um, had given a lot of attention the last couple of years to the UN database. Um, the, in 2016, the UN uh, Human Rights Council voted in favor of establishing a uh, database a database of companies involved in business activities with uh, Israeli settlements. Um, the Israeli settlements in occupied Palestinian territory are considered illegal under international law and doing businesses with these settlements means supporting a situation that is illegal and enabling these um, illegal settlements to flourish. Um, a database of businesses with activities or relationships in settlements would pr provide transparency for states, businesses, and, um, and the public. Originally, the database was uh, expected to be released in 2017. However, it took till uh, the beginning of this year till the list of companies had been published. Um, the delay had been uh, apparently been caused by pressure by Israel, the United States, and others. Um, uh, many organizations uh, like Al Haq, like um, uh, Cairo Institute, um, but also Oxfam, Pax, SOMO, the Rights Forum, had been pushing for, um, for the release of the database. Um, among the 112 companies in the list that had been published in February this year, there are also four Dutch um, companies. Um, um, and the majority of them are, the majority of the companies are Israeli, but uh, also four Dutch. Um, 
the list provides transparency and for that reason it can help other businesses and so civil society in taking decisions um yeah i think um maybe it's good to, uh, also to mention that um there had been also some pressure for example on dutch pension funds to uh, divest from um from from uh, companies that are on the list um and this has uh, resulted in um, uh, a Dutch pension fund, uh, ABP, uh, divesting from two of the banks that are on the list. So um, we do think that this transparency can help, but I think it's, it's um, let's give the floor or the screen to Maha now to explain more about, um, about the database and about how it had been established and the, the, the importance of it. Thank you so much, Gerard and Thomas, for the introduction. And thank you for the organizers who have put this uh, timely event together today. And uh, in my in intervention today, I will be speaking about how and why the UN database came into being. What should we as civil society organizations, whether in Palestine or in Europe or elsewhere, do to make the best out of the information that has already been released by the United Nations? and how to make sure that it continues as a living mechanism in the future. So first, let us start by looking at uh, some of the reasons why we need a UN database and its significance in the Palestinian context, but also worldwide. In the midst of uh, everything that has been happening in Palestine, from systematic human rights violations, oppression, elimination, excessive use of force, killings, forced displacement, collective punishment, and the many, many more, Civil society is still keen to not only shed light on the role of private actors and companies in Israel's occupation, their complicity and involvement in violations like the annexation wall, appropriation of land, exploitation and destruction of resources, but also to hold these private actors to account in accordance with responsibilities and obligations that have already been set forth under international law for businesses and states. And uh, looking at the corporate involvement in Israel's illegal settlement enterprise, which has facilitated population transfer and forced displacement, among others, has, it has also resulted in a persisting and detrimental reality and devastating socioeconomic impacts on Palestinians and the denial of their basic rights. Notably, here we're talking about the right to self-determination and permanent sovereignty over natural resources, like land and water, which are key, the right to work and livelihood, restrictions on freedom of movement and many others, and all of which have been, have been very well and clearly documented over the years. So businesses and corporations who have uh, profited of facilitated and incentivized illegal settlement activities and annexation have also contributed to the creation of unilateral facts on the ground and a reality of permanent occupation, which is illegal, but it has also considerably undermined any possibility to realize a just peace and the prospects of a two-state solution, which the Netherlands and the EU have strongly been supportive of both politically and financially for many years. And these are some of the many reasons why Palestinian civil society has put immense efforts towards the creation, development and the release of the UN database of businesses involved in Israeli settlements as one way to expose this role, the role of businesses and to counter it, to put an end to it. And these efforts were also picked up by international and regional organizations who have joined the advocacy efforts and pushed it forward towards the release of the database. So, in, in, in addition to the reasons that I already mentioned, the UN database is also significant and we need to stress its significance because as uh, Gerard said, it identifies and lists businesses that are directly or indirectly violating uh, international humanitarian and human rights law, whether in their operations, relationships or activities with illegal Israeli settlements. So it is a tool of transparency that could help states, businesses, civil society, and even the regular consumer to know what these companies are doing and to ensure that companies are not complicit or involved in gross human rights violations. 
And something that is often missed about the significance of such a UN database is the fact that, you know, it could also serve as a universal model for business enterprises that are involved in and profiting from other situations where there's political instability, armed conflict, occupation, colonization, and vulnerable communities and populations are being exploited. So it's an exercise or a tool that should and have been in fact applied to other situations of con conflict, maybe in slightly different structures, like in the situation of Myanmar, for example. And this is all important because we need to know what these companies and private actors are doing in such situations. And we need to call them out because they're often involved in grave breaches of international law and crimes. So following the civil society's repeated appeals to the UN Office of the High Commissioner and to parliamentarians around the world, ministries of foreign affairs and diplomatic representations and other influential uh, policymakers, uh, in February 2020, almost four years since the establishment of Human Rights Council Resolution 3136, which originally gave the mandate uh, to create the UN database, there was a report listing 112 companies, both Israeli and multinational, that are associated with Israeli settlements. It was finally released, so it finally saw the light. And I say finally because uh, it, took, uh, it took a lot of uh, effort and a lot of years in order to uh, come to this result. And the UN Office of the High Commissioner came under an immense amount of pressure from states, mainly the United States and Israel, unsurprisingly, but also other associated non-state actors and groups in order to undermine and not release this database. Therefore, we've seen repeated and unexplained delays by the UN Office in its publication of, uh, of the database. And this is important to keep in mind when we look at the, at the, you know, at the historical proceedings of such, a, of such a mandate. But now that the database has been published, it is also important to collectively think as human rights organizations, civil society, and even activists around the world, in Palestine and in Europe, about how we can best act and best make use of the information that has already been released in this report in February. So the list of the 112 uh, companies, while it does not really include all of the businesses, so it's not comprehensive of businesses that are involved with, settlement, with the settlement enterprise, it is still very important and it's an important step and it contains valuable information that we build on, that we should build on a lot. And now that we have the, this list of 112 companies released by the United Nations, we as civil society, we need to take the proper action to make sure that the list is effective and is put into use. And we can see it from two main angles. One, in a way to prevent the companies listed from com continuing to operate in and trade with Israeli settlements. And here I mainly refer to the multinational companies that are on the list, which are, uh, I believe, 18 of the 112. And to this end, we need to mobilize states, particularly those that are home states of multinationals on the list, such as the Netherlands, for example, to take the appropriate action with regards to the four Dutch companies listed, which are Booking.com, Tahal Group, Altis Europe, and Cardan. Excuse me for my pronunciation. And um, ideally, the Netherlands would, uh, would have welcomed the release of the UN database, which it did not. And it would explicitly stress the need to fulfill the Human Rights Council resolution mandate in its entirety and technically support its annual update. However, what we had from the Dutch government is um, as a response or a reaction to the release of the database is that they continue to say that the, the Dutch government is not in favor of the database, but it still acknowledges that it is a product of the Human Rights Council resolution, which mu must be implemented nonetheless, which is somehow positive. And the Dutch official reaction to the database has been also fairly soft in saying that the government considers business activities that contribute to the development or perpetuation of such settlements in occupied territories to be undesirable. So here we, use, we see the use of soft language again. 
And the Dutch ministers said that, you know, the government has been discouraging economic relation with companies in Israeli settlements and occupied territory for years. But it also said that it does not provide services to Dutch companies who have activities with settlements. Again, this is this is uh, towards a positive uh, and more st uh, strict and uh, uh, guide or uh, measure that should be taken. And uh, in, in the reaction as well to the UN database, while the Dutch, uh, Dutch uh, government did list some of the expectation for Dutch companies surrounding the implementation of the OECD guidelines and the UN guiding principles, they did not say much about what consequences these four companies would face or whether it will approach them or provide more guidance or take any other measures. And as we are all very well aware, soft language of discouragement without any concrete actions, especially with businesses and especially considering entrenched impunity in the context of Israel-Palestine, are not sufficient by, to be taken by the Netherlands, whether as a home state or as, for, for these multinationals or as a third party state. So some of, the, some of the things that the Netherlands should take in order to uh, build on, on such a database is to first communicate with these companies listed, remind them and encourage them to comply with their responsibilities under international law, including humanitarian law, which is very relevant to the context. It should also urge the companies to terminate any business activities or relationships that may be in breach of domestic and international law. And in addition to uh, providing guidance for companies linked to Israeli settlements, the Netherlands should impose mandatory enhanced human rights due diligence for such companies in order to avoid being involved in and contributing to human rights violations and breaches of international law. And one, 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 uh, one additional thing from this angle would be to complement the Netherlands' relatively progressive approach in the business and human rights framework and use the database as an additional incentive for the Netherlands to identify and implement necessary additions to its domestic regulatory processes and legislations that would provide for stricter provisions to regulate extra cor uh, extraterritorial corporate activities in situations like the occupied Palestinian territory, but which could also apply to other conflict affected areas around the world. And that would give better guidance to investors and procurers, for example. And I think uh, my colleagues Giovanni and Valentina will be speaking more in details about some of these elements later on in the webinar. And uh, another angle would be to uh, look at the banning of settlement products and services as uh, stemming from the duty of states to not, to not recognize or not provide any assistance. And here I'm thinking more about the 100 that, uh, of the fact that of the 112 companies listed in the report of the UN database, the majority are Israeli companies and not multinationals. And in this case, the Netherlands it must implement its obligations, which, is, which are largely reflected in customary international law and stemming from the duty of states to cooperate, to bring a, a breach to an end through lawful means, as well as duties of non-recognition, non-aid, non-assistance in relation to an illegal situation, such as that of the Israeli settlements in the OPT. And therefore, the Netherlands has a duty to ban products, services, and relationships originating from and linked to Israel's illegal settlement enterprise. And in fact, by allowing and continuing to allow the import of these goods and services produced from exploited Palestinian resources into Dutch markets, the Netherlands is in breach of its duties under international law. And as such, the banning of settlement products is not what some would think or categorize as a boycott or a sanction against Israel. As I just mentioned, it purely stems from a general duty for states that is very clear and visible under international law. And on this point, it would also be worth uh, mentioning or noting that the labeling and mandatory labeling guidelines for settlement products, although it is important and uh, a development, but it has proven to be ineffective at deterring settlement products and services from being sold in external markets like in Europe. And therefore, it continues to contribute to the illegal settlement enterprise, to the growth, to the expansion of, uh, of settlements on, on, on stolen Palestinian land and from stolen resources. So as attempts to label settlement products accordingly are insufficient, international law does require their banning so as not to assist the economy of illegal Israeli settlements. 
So it seems that we have plenty of work to do as civil society in order to make the best use of the information that has been already released in the first report of the UN database. But we also need to make sure that it continues to be updated every year by the United Nations. So the question here is how do we keep the UN database alive? And in order to uh, make sure that it continues to serve as a database, as a living mechanism, we as civil society, but also UN member states, including the Netherlands as a leader in its commitment to the rule of law and human rights standards, need to make sure that the original Human Rights Council resolution mandate of 2016 is fulfilled in its entirety and that it is annually updated. And while in its report in February 2020, the UN High Commissioner did recommend that the update of the database be carried out by a group of independent experts, as opposed to her office, which have already created the, the database, it's, it's, uh, it's believed that the annual database or the annual update should remain within the framework of the Office of the High Commissioner and continue as long as corporate involvement in and profiteering from settlements activities persist. And the, the, the emphasis on, on the annual update to remain within the framework or the auspices of the Office of the High Commissioner stems from the thinking that, you know, despite all the challenges and odds that face the UN office in developing, creating the methodology and releasing the database and producing it, it does not make sense for it now to try and absolve itself from the responsibility to fulfill the mandate in its entirety. And um, it is also important to uh, think about the three main uh, elements that, uh, that continue to arise in the past four years now since, uh, since the creation or since, uh, yeah, since the, the creation of, uh, of Human Rights Council Resolution 3136, in which the Office of the High Commissioner has repeatedly used to claim its inability to produce or to develop the UN database, which are limited or lack of financial resources, having an unclear mandate and guidelines and the, 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 the intense political pressure that it has been subjected to. So while, while it's important to acknowledge the, these, these three uh, elements, we also need to uh, think about how to resolve them once and for all. So in this case, some, some of the recommendations would be that you know, the, the UN office and UN member states, including the Netherlands, they need to make sure that there are enough uh, resources, financial resources allocated for the annual update of the database. And they need to make sure that uh, the, the annual update is built on the original mandate of the Human Rights Council Resolution 3136 of 2016. And lastly, and importantly, ensure and emphasize that the UN office maintains their independence and are able to execute their mandates impartially without any interference, without any threats or any uh, similar uh, measures being taken against them. And uh, lastly, before uh, I conclude, uh, I mean, it's, it's um, generally speaking, businesses, they cannot just continue to make massive efforts and uh, massive, sorry, profits and exercise leverage, whether in Palestine or elsewhere, while contributing to and being involved in serious human rights violations and even crimes for such a long time. We, we need to work together to, to end this, uh, this corporate impunity for human rights, for environmental violations and crimes in Palestine, just like we, like the civil society has been doing so everywhere else around the world, whether that be it through the UN database or the legally binding instrument that's currently being developed at the UN level or through other domestic, regional or international initiatives that are calling for a strict and binding regulations for corporate activities. And I will stop here. I hope that my uh, intervention wasn't too long or too technical, but I'm always happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Maha, I appreciate it. There are indeed already some questions came in, so we will definitely get back to you later. Uh, kind request in case you want also the other attendees to see your question, please uh, select all panelists and attendees, otherwise only uh, we can see the question. Um, thanks a lot, Maha. Uh, Pauline, the floor is yours. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, now, 
uh, once again, um, welcome uh, to all of you, uh, speakers and participants. Uh, glad that uh, while we already started, more participants uh, came in. Welcome, everybody. I have the pleasure to introduce uh, the second, second speaker uh, of this webinar, so Dr. David Gattenberg. He, um, he will speak in a minute. He is uh, from Winnipeg, Canada. He's a university instructor, publicist, and human rights activist. And he will speak very specifically about the legal struggles that he, in my word, uh, embarked upon uh, since 2017 in Canada uh, to ensure wines that are imported to Canada originating from uh, illegal Israeli settlements in OPT are labeled as they should, uh, as such, as they should be. And uh, now he will go into detail of this struggle, has seen a lot of ups and downs and phases, um, arguments and counter arguments being presented and he will not guide us through uh, yeah, that. Um, I want to say a word on, uh, on SOMO. SOMO is a um, research organization based in the Netherlands and focusing on human rights and labor rights violations in various sectors and global supply chains. And from from that interest, from that expertise, we have also been looking in trade flows of products produced in illegal Israeli settlements in the OPT, and very particularly fresh fruit, vegetables, and herbs, and uh, trying to get clear information on on the scope of these trade flows in terms of uh, products, value, volume, uh, um, involved actors, uh, they export the producers, exporters, traders, importers, uh, has proven to be very difficult um, uh, to, to get yeah, the um, concrete objective data on, the, on this trade. Uh, we know that the EU are a very important um, taker of such, such products, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, the Netherlands is uh, among the European countries, uh, one of the biggest importers of fruit and vegetables from Israel. Um, Israel, but uh, within that trade flow, it's yeah, nearly impossible to distinguish what comes from Israel and what comes from um, um, illegal Israeli settlements in the OPT. Um, uh, we have and now many reasons for that and one of the reasons is that uh, as maha also clearly said is that the the labeling regulations that are in place in the EU, eu and on national levels in eu member states are not sufficient are not properly implemented and are therefore yeah, sort of useless um now what somo tried in the past years is um get in touch directly with supermarkets that uh, have such fresh fruit and vegetables on their shelves and ask them how they, what their policies are, what their practices are, what their verification mechanisms are to see uh, from whom they buy and what they buy. Try to also to uh, get information from them on how they label such products uh, if they would come from settlements. Um, we have been in touch um, with uh, Netherlands Statistics or Central Bureau for the Statistique, CBS filed a whole series of freedom of information requests with the Dutch custom office also to unearth such information on trade flows. We have been engaging with the Dutch Food and Consumer Product Safety Authority or NVWA uh, as they in the Netherlands are responsible for the supervision and enforcement of these labeling regulations. Now knocking on all these doors has yeah sort of been in vain because transparency on yeah, this topic is really, really lacking, um, which is very uh, problematic. Um, so on that alarming note, I want to give the floor to uh, David Gattenberg, who will stop speak about his particular struggle in Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline, and uh, um, uh, hello to everybody from Canada. It's, uh, 8.30 here in the morning. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm going to uh, uh, share, my, uh, share my screen. Share screen, here we go. Uh, this, is, uh, this is my presentation. So, you know, uh, I've been an activist. Uh, I mean, a university science instructor and a web, web 
publisher and, and also an activist, very concerned about Israel and Palestine. And over the years, uh, um, kind of interested in, in, in pursuing justice in Palestine. And being a wine drinker, uh, at one point it occurred to me, you know, I should try to find out what the what are the settlement wine products that are being sold in Canada? So uh, in the course of casting about, uh, I thought, well, I, I should check the web page of the, what I gather is the largest liquor re retailer in the world, I gather, <clears throat> which is um, the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, the LCBO. <clears throat> so, um, I went to the LCBO site and um, in search of settlement wine product. And in January of 2017, uh, I'm going to go slideshow, slideshow from beginning. Here we go. So in, in, in January of 2017, <clears throat> I, I identified two wine products on sale at the website of the LCBO that were clearly settlement wine products. The first was uh, Sago Winery M Series Chardonnay KP214, which you can see on your right, faded on the screen. It's a, a, a white wine, um, actually a very nice white wine, as it happens, and, and Sheila Legend KP2012. So I've been to the West Bank, uh, occupied Palestine, on a whole bunch of occasions I've traveled up and down and I, I, I know these locations. So I did a little bit of my own personal due diligence and confirmed that indeed Sag, Sago was produced, produced at Sago Settlement right on the eastern margins of Ramallah. And Shiloh legend comes from Shiloh, Eli, <coughs> which is in the northern West Bank. So having done my due diligence, I complained to the LCBO in January 2017. I said, these wines are, were not produced in Israel uh, as labeled. You need to fix it. Uh, and you need to fix the problem. And uh, the, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is the, the Canadian entity, the Canadian federal agency that, amongst other things, concerns itself with food and product safety and labeling issues. Um, the, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency became involved very early on in late January 2017. The LCBO uh, consulted with the CFIA to ask what they should do. Um, but I, I formally complained to the, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in March of 2017. Um, and then <clears throat> the, wheels, the wheels turned and, uh, you know, cutting the story short, uh, on July 11th, 2017, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, after having examined this, this situation up and down and left and right and all sideways, um, determined that <clears throat> these, these product of Israel labels were indeed non-compliant. Um, they violated the Food and Drug Act and the Consumer Packaging and Labeling Act in Canada, which are the, 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 the two principal the pieces of enabling legislation for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And, and the CFIA also determined, went to the, the Global Affairs Canada website and confirmed that Canada uh, formally does not consider the West Bank to be part of Israel. It considers Israel to be an occupying power and so on and so on. So on July 11, 2017, the CFIA advised the, the LCBO, the product of Israel labels were, were non-compliant. So I call this the, the initial decision. Um, then <clears throat> between January 11th and, I'm sorry, this is mislabeled. This is July 11th to 13th. From July 11th to 13th, 2017, the, 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 the shit hit the fan, uh, as, it, as it were. And I know a whole lot about what happened in those 48 hours between the announcement, the advisory notice from the CFIA to the LCBO, take these wine products off your shelves. Um, the Canadian, uh, the Israeli government complained and pro-Israeli lobbyists in, in Canada complained. And, and on, the, on the, the afternoon of July 13th, uh, July 13th, 2017, the CFIA issued a, a reversal, it's a reversal decision. 
So it had taken five and a half months for it to come to the decision that product of Israel labels are non-compliant. It took about, really in reality, it took about a business day for the CFIA to reverse itself. And the quote that was posted up on the website, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency regrets the outcome um, uh, uh, of <laughs> the wine labeling assessment, which led to the LCBO's response regarding products from the two wineries. In our assessment, we did not fully consider the Canada-Israel free trade agreement, SIFTA. Now I'm gonna get back to SIFTA in a moment. So the, the, the rationale for, for the mea culpa from the CFIA was, oops, we didn't consider the Canada-Israel free trade agreement, uh, which permits product of Israel labeling um, on settlement wines. So on, on that, was, that was the 13th of July, 2017. On August 6th, um, uh, I, uh, I uh, together with my lawyer, Dimitri Lascaris, um, appealed the, the CFIA's reversal decision to the, to the Complaints and Appeals Office of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Um, uh, there was a whole rigmarole that was un uncoiled in response to my complaint. And on September 28th of 2017, the CFIA, the Complaints and Appeals Office of the CFIA rejected my appeal and upheld the decision of the CFIA. So on October 24th, uh, Dimitri, uh, on my behalf, filed what we call an application for judicial review the Federal Court of Canada because the CFIA is a federal government agency, decisions that are, are made by federal government agencies in Canada are subject to judicial review by a federal court judge. So on October 24th, application for judicial review was, was filed and, and the federal court was asked, we asked the federal court to declare in our application for judicial review, declare that the CFIA decision to permit the importation and sale of product of Israel settlement wines breaches by the CFIA's enabling legislation, namely the Food and Drugs Act and the Consumer Package and Labeling Act. I won't go into the details. Anybody, by the way, who wants to get copies of all these various documents that have been filed, you can contact me and I'd be, well, give me great pleasure to provide you with documents. We also asked the federal court to declare that neither the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement nor its Implementation Act actually authorize um, um, settlement products be labeled product of Israel. Um, and in fact, there's nothing, I'll get into this, there's nothing in SIFTA that, that has anything to do with labeling. SIFTA labeling is not a SIFTA purpose. Product labeling on Canadian store shelves is not a, any one of the purposes of SIFTA. SIFTA's purpose is to eliminate tariffs, and other unfair trade practices and labeling is not one of them. Um, we also asked the federal court to, um, to declare that the importation and sale of settlement wines violate Canada's 1985 Geneva Conventions Act. Canada has incorporated the fourth Geneva Convention into its own domestic legislation. And this is called the, the Geneva Conventions Act and that the sale of settlement wines also violates Canada's obligations as a party of the United Nations Charter and to the Fourth Geneva Convention. So, um, Dimitri uh, has represented me pro bono. Uh, I mean, the hours, hundreds and hundreds of hours put in by Dimitri Lascaris. I mean, Dimitri, Dimitri needs to be carried around for the rest of his life on a sedan chair for, for all his support. And, and the... the the argument set forth in, in our initial memorandum of fact and law to the Federal Court of Canada was West Bank's not part of Israel. Product of Israel labels violate Canada's Food and Drug Act and Consumer Packaging Labeling Act because they're, they misrepresent the product. Uh, product labeling is not a SIFTA purpose. I mean, you come through SIFTA and it's enabling legislation. So it's totally silent on labeling. Um, SIFTA must be interpreted in accordance with international law. And <clears throat> finally, evidence does not actually establish that Israel's customs laws are applied in the West Bank. 
The, the argument was that under SIFTA, the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement defines, this is very interesting, defines Canada, a, a Canada as the geographical, the territory where uh, Canada applies its customs laws. Israel was defined as the territory where Israel's customs laws are applied. Is a very interesting distinction. And we all know that, of course, the settlements have been de facto annexed. So, of course, Israeli customs laws are applied in the settlements, but actually it's a de facto move and, and there isn't any basis in law or regulation or anything. And there's certainly no basis for it in the underlying documents, SIFTA's underlying documents, which are the, you know, the, 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 the Israel, the Israel PLO economic protocol, otherwise known as the Paris Protocol, is the basis for, for Israel's extended customs area, and it says nothing about settlements. So evidence does not actually establish that Israel's customs laws are applied in the West Bank. Interesting argument. So um, then, uh, you know, just before the, the, the federal court case, um, Global Affairs Canada released additional documents to me um, uh, through access to information, Global Affairs Canada's Foreign Affairs, and we filed an additional affidavit and factum, which was accepted by, by the court, by the Federal Court of Canada, and, and in these documents that were released to me, uh, Global Affairs Canada trade specialists, people really in the know, Adv had advised the CFIA that SIFTA has no bearing on product labeling prior to the initial decision. They, they told the CFIA this in May of 2000, May, June 2017. So the CFIA had been told by Global Affairs Canada, forget SIFTA, it's got nothing to do with anything. Um, the CFIA was pressured, these documents revealed in, in the 48 hours after the initial decision, they, the CFIA faced enormous pressure from the Privy Council Office, which is the office that advises the Prime Minister, and from the Prime Minister's office itself. Uh, Justin Trudeau was in the loop, uh, as well the pressure from the government of Israel and, and Canadian pro-Israel lobbyists. So this is why the CFIA reversed its decision. It didn't reverse its decision because new information was provided to it about SIFTA, I mean, phony information was provided to it. It was a red herring. The reason why CFIA reversed itself was because it was, it was pressured to do so by the, the, the highest, highest authorities within the Canadian federal government. So the decision to reverse, uh, as on top of it all, preceded internal CFIA consultations. Um, they, so they, this is a minor detail, but it's an important one that we've presented, we presented to the federal court. The CFIA president reversed his decision following conversations with the Privy Council office and the Prime Minister's office. Um, so, um, Independent Jewish Voices Canada and B'nai B'rith Canada both intervened in our federal court case. IJV is a, a progressive Jewish organization. Uh, B'nai B'rith Canada is, d defines itself as a staunch defender of the government of Israel. So they intervened. So our court case took place uh, at the end of May 2019. The ruling was issued on July 29th. I was in Strasbourg at the time and learned that the Federal Court of Canada was about to rule. It was one of the, the most, uh, I, geez, I, boy, was I on tenterhooks that day. And the, the Federal Court of Canada ruled in, in our favor. Uh, and the ruling, uh, the Honorable Justice Ann McTavish ruled that the sifted definition of territory is only intended to apply to matters within the scope of SIFTA and product labeling is not a SIFTA purpose. Uh, she also said that all parties agree the settlements are not part of Israeli territory. So ergo, product of Israel labeling is false, misleading, and deceptive. And most interestingly, uh, Justice McTavish um, sided with the argument put forward by independent Jewish voices as attorney, uh, the eminent uh, uh, lawyer Barb Jackman, that product of Israel labeling inhibits consumers' ability to express political views through purchasing choices, 
limiting their charter right to freedom of expression. This was a, a major landmark conclusion that Canadians have the rights to, to exercise free speech. And part of that is purchasing the products they wish to purchase. And if they're being misled, then the freedom of speech is a dead letter. So just as McTavish did not consider the legal status of settlement, she set, set, set aside any consideration of it. And she also set aside our additional factum and affidavit. She did not consider any of the, the evidence that I received through that freedom of information request as it happened. She didn't reject it, she just didn't consider it. So the government of Canada is now appealing on, on September 6th, six weeks before federal elections here in Canada. Um, the, the government, um, the government uh, announced the Attorney General that it's appealing to the Federal Court of Appeal, arguing that the reasonableness standard was incorrectly applied. This was the standard upon which federal court ju judges adjudicate administrative decisions. It's called the reasonableness standard. And, and the Attorney General said, you know, Justice McTavish did not correctly apply the reasonableness standard. And, and the federal government's also challenging this notion of conscientious purchasing and the charter argument that Justice McTavish upheld. Um, but the government is not challenging any of the substantive issues. So um, seeking intervention in support of our, of our federal court of appeal, like right? we're going to the federal court of appeal and in support of our appeal, um, in support of the federal Canada ruling, um, independent Jewish Voices, Amnesty International, the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association, Transnational Law and Justice Network, the Center for Free Expression, and the Canadian Lawyers for International Human Rights in Al-Haq, are those seeking to intervene in opposition to the Federal Court of Canada ruling. B'nai B'rith Canada, of course, uh, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, which is Canada's APAC, um, this guy, Eugene Kontorovich, which I'm sure many of you have heard of him, and, and Sago Winery, the winery in question, uh, is actually seeking full party status uh, and failing that, just intervener status, and they're represented by the Lawfare Project. Um, so it's going to take place in the first half of 2021. I mean, COVID-19 has thrown a major spanner in the works. So, you know, the appeal has been delayed. It'll, you know, likely be heard in the first half of 2021. Uh, major issues to come forward at the Federal Court of Appeal um, from our argument that the, the, the Attorney General erred, the Attorney General made, made a, a big mistake arguing that actually the underlying legislation uh, makes no mention of conscientious consumer choices. Actually, the Food and Drug Act and specifically the Consumer Packaging and Labeling Act, you know, all the parliamentary debate, consumer choices were indeed mentioned. And there's this real, fabulous quote, I'm gonna wrap this up, fabulous quote uh, from the enabling, you know, the debate within Parliament back in the 1960s about, uh, you know, Canada grade A potatoes which is just a, a grading term, um, a grading term. It doesn't mean that the potatoes are produced in Canada. It just means they, they're produced according to the standards. So the quote from the enabling legislation is, there's no reason why we should not have South Dakota potatoes for sale in Canada, but the consumer should not be confused into thinking that they are Manitoba potatoes. So, um, very interesting. Uh, big, big, big one. Uh, just before um, the deadline for submitting FACTA uh, in the appeal, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada issued a landmark ruling, uh, Minister of Citizenship and Immigration versus Vavilov. I mean, you can check out this case. It's got absolutely nothing to do with product labeling. It's got to do with the Vavilov was a, a guy who lost his citizenship in Canada because his parents were Soviet spies. Uh, this went to court and the Supreme Court of Canada ruled at two critical elements of, of the Supreme Court ruling. The Supreme Court expanded um, the, the reasonableness standard 
uh, and put forward new, more elaborate reasonableness standards for deciding whether or not the CFIA, for example, came up with a reasonable decision. And, and the, the new standards really undermine the complaints and appeals office's determination, uh, seriously undermine it. Uh, and, and secondly, most interestingly, um, Vavilov, the Supreme Court of Canada, stated that domestic legislation, like in other words, interpretation of the Food and Drug Act and the Consumer Packaging and Labeling Act, must be interpreted in a manner that reflects customary and conventional international law. So uh, the CFIA and the Complaints and Appeals Office totally ignored my, my numerous arguments throughout the complaint that you know, allowing settlement products into Canada, labeled product of Israel, violates Canada's obligations under the UN Charter um, and under the Fourth Geneva Convention and under the Geneva Conventions Act. They totally ignored that completely. And so Vavilov, the Supreme Court of Canada, really says that entities like the Canadian Food Inspection C have to take have to take international law into account. This is huge. So um, stay tuned, my my friends out there. And here's a link to my, my GoFundMe page. Uh, Dimitri Lascaris has, uh, you know, d waged this battle pro bono from the beginning, uh, but we're trying to raise money for all the various costs which, you know, build up. And this is where you can, you can, you can support, support all that. So uh, I'm gonna stop my share and um, I, I'm four minutes up. I'm about one minute over. So thank you all, glad to answer questions. Thanks a lot, David. Very interesting to hear about your journey with <laughs> Canadian courts. I bet there are quite some questions, so feel free to type them. And then we'll get back to you later, David. Really, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, now on to the last topic. Uh, Kirat, go ahead. Yes. Thank you, David. You're still that passionate about it uh, as the first time that we talked about it. Uh, when we took a cup of coffee, no wine at that moment, but um, <laughs> um, you didn't lose your, your energy about it. That's, uh, that's good to see. Um, yes, the first, the, the next um, topic, um, the following session, we will have two speakers, uh, Valentina Azarova and uh, Giovanni Fassina, and they will talk about uh, public procurement. Um, well, um, they had been introduced already by, um, by Thomas, but um, Dr. Valentina Zarova is an um, international legal academic and practitioner, a visiting academic at the Manchester International Law Centre, uh, University of Manchester, and Giovanni is the director of the European Legal Support uh, Centre. Um, yeah, the public procurement is an issue that is, um, is, is uh, relevant also at this moment um, in the Netherlands. Um, we are um, facing also as a right forum together with the uh, European Legal Support Center issues um, in, with, with uh, public transport concessions. Uh, Giovanni will talk more about it. And um, so actually I will leave the floor or the screen again um, to Valentina first and then to Giovanni. Um, they will have to tell a lot. So the floor is yours, the screen is yours. Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, thanks again to the organizers uh, and for the introduction. I'll get right into it given the task at hand. So the focus of my brief remarks is the question whether and to what extent the third states um, and their public procurers in particular are actively required to exclude tendering companies as potential suppliers of public services uh, if they maintain links with an illicit economy in occupied territory, as is uh, the case of the um, economy of Israel settlements in the OPT. But I will speak to um, briefly other economies of occupation as well. So the answer to this question lies beyond domestic or indeed, indeed even EU public procurement law um, and requires looking at one public procurement as a transnational legal process by which 
third states can enforce to some degree indirectly um, uh, a certain standard of international law on their corporate nationals and to um, the international legal obligations that indeed demand such um, uh, passive enforcement um, upon corporate nationals and uh, specifically in this case upon state agents because uh, that is the status of public procurers. So let me say from the outset that although public procurement um, and, and public procurers as, as, as actors are certainly permitted under EU public procurement law and under domestic law that implements certain exclusion criteria, as we will see, to exclude suppliers with links to illicit economies in occupied territory and perhaps even requires and expects that such activities be seriously considered by public procurers when making a decision on procurement we are uh, short of a standard uh, and certainly a practice uh, whereby states are required to mandate such procurement. Uh, but I will argue or try to at least um, present you with some of the broad strokes that we can discuss further in the questions um, that there is growing expert consensus as a matter of international law and perhaps transnational law that third states are under an obligation to enable international law compliant public procurement and in our case the case of illicit economies in occupied territory indeed to require such exclusion um, so uh, briefly on the actual uh, bases in public procurement law uh, that require consideration as i noted and indeed uh, uh, um, assessment of act certain activities that are sometimes term termed as non-economic or non-procurement considerations there are two relevant bases very briefly and we can come back to all of these referential slides um, one, and, and the primary one, is uh, if an economic operator is seen as guilty of grave professional misconduct. This is misconduct that affects uh, the economic actor's professional integrity uh, and include, understood to include also social um, considerations. The second is a question of transparency. Um, a question of enabling uh, the procurer to make a decision so um, misleading misrepresenting or not revealing information that's relevant so a high standard of transparency is already mandated in existing law of course the problems very briefly are known is that it is a discretionary uh, these are discretionary or optional uh, criteria to begin with uh, from the perspective of EU law um, when implemented by member states, but also when it comes to the assessments made by procurers, the balancing exercise that the procurement decision making process requires really does not um, uh, provide much bright line rules as such in and of itself. So we have to look beyond procurement law to understand whether procurers are required to do something more in our case. Before doing so, however, uh, let me make two further remarks uh, on <laughs> the um, extensive literature of public procurement law. One is that public procurement is seen as a policy tool, and this is considerable because privatization and out outsourcing of public services is a matter of international law, uh, remains within the domain of the state when it comes to its responsibility and the way such services are conducted. So not only are public procurers state agents, but businesses that are brought within the state's domain are acting on behalf of the state. And so in international responsibility terms are de facto state agents and decisions in relation to the activities of such businesses have been influenced particularly um, explicitly in some cases by states when it comes to violations. So uh, I'll come back to a couple of examples. Um, the state will be concerned therefore very briefly with two or at least uh, in our case three uh, as, as pertains the OPT uh, areas of existing policy um, that will uh, need to be projected to one extent or another uh, through public procurement law. One is the general area of business and human rights, the National Action Plan, 
uh, uh, that the uh, state has to implement the UN guiding principles. Another uh, is the specific positions in relation to the occupation in question, which are very clear um, and, and, and settled with regards to uh, the OPT. And three is an area uh, of um, domestic policy and law in relation to the uh, grave breaches regime of the, of, the, of the Geneva Conventions, that is international humanitarian law, which uh, um, in domestic law uh, are often defined as criminal acts. And by being defined as criminal acts, uh, they require other areas of domestic legislation to deter uh, or at least uh, uh, maintain policy coherence in relation to their deterrence. Um, briefly, as a result of the clear positions on Israeli settlements, certain advisories have been issued to uh, over 18, in fact, uh, states have issued advisories to businesses. It's the UK advisory, apologies, maybe not as relevant uh, um, anymore. Um, but uh, these advisories indicate that there will be risks resulting from uh, business in settlements in the uh, domestic jurisdiction of the business. And so it is merely a, uh, a threat uh, or, or at least an advisory in relation to what consequences can be expected. It has not been translated in many cases into uh, more specific uh, policy uh, guidance, um, except for in the case of the Scottish procurement note as regards to procurement law specifically. A further brief point uh, on, on, on uh, the, the purpose or function of public procurement law and, and, and the process is that it is intended to function in the public interest, that is to protect the interests of the serviced public. And um, in brief, by analogy, we may recall or draw on the significance of the turn to social and ethical considerations and their protection uh, by consumer protection law. So again, an emphasis on transparency, an emphasis on the need to uh, account in the decision uh, making about procurement uh, uh, for such considerations, but indeed also, uh, uh, if, if we take it a step further, a way for the public to contest the use of certain businesses and indeed even to participate in the use of taxpayer money here. Um, so it is a, a, a public debate that should be happening. As a matter of international law, there are two very important international legal bases from which we can deduce at least a regulatory uh, requirement um, that businesses that corporate nationals with links to illicit economies in occupied territories incur some liabilities in domestic law. And public procurement law is one such area. Uh, the first basis uh, in international law, very briefly, is the uh, responsibility of third states to respond to certain unlawful situations in a particular way and of course not to aid or assist them but that response is one of non-recognition as lawful um, and it has certainly been established that this customary obligation codified by the International Law Commission is applicable to um, illegal occupations, uh, if you will, uh, and indeed the uh, unlawful admin administrative and legislative acts of occupying states in certain contexts beyond uh, that of Israel and the OPT. Um, the basic logic here is one of deterring the sustaining interfaces with unlawful serious acts, seriously unlawful acts in such unlawful situations. Um, it is different from complicity, it is different from uh, a criminal responsibility. And I'm happy to come back and discuss this further. Uh, in the interests of time, I will say that, of course, the uh, positions of uh, many states reflect this, and states have acted on this obligation, um, and the EU as well has acted on this obligation in what is now referred to uh, widely as the differentiation between Israel and the OPT or the distinction between um, 
activities taking place beyond the green line and those in Israel, and that is seen as a requirement and imperative indeed uh, for any relations with Israel, and, and again, by extension, other occupying powers. Uh, notably, importantly, very, very quickly, it is different from what the UK government had uh, in 2016 noted was not permissible under procurement law, and that is its use as a tool to boycott. It is, uh, in other words, the uh, determination of an unlawful situation, the response to such situations is not a political choice. It is uh, an absolute necessity and a bare minimum requirement of all states in relation to, again, other uh, ty uh, types of occupation of particular, uh, that the chair particular violative characteristics, structural wrongs, uh, we can come back to this. Uh, and, and the one authoritative uh, uh, database for that is, is indeed the rule of law. Um, an armed conflict database at the Geneva Academy, since there is quite a, a bit of variation on what is considered occupied, including by, by civil society. So um, my final point indeed is that as a result of this labeling of the uh, um, situation of an illicit economy in occupied territory as an unlawful situation, in the case of the OPT in particular, we've also come to understand the particular uh, nature of business and human rights obligations that states, home states and businesses have in relation to such uh, unique business environments where the occupying power indeed has an obligation to withdraw and end the occupation and where businesses must avoid and terminate all operations in what is known as an immitigable business environment. This was clarified by the OHCHR database report and previous HRC resolutions. So in sum, it appears that um, there is very strong policy and regulatory need to deter such uh, sustaining uh, um, illegal acts as the decision to procure public services from a business involved in such illegalities. And I would say that threefold to do so, states must want elaborate a policy screen, wouldn't be unique of the sort that, that the Scottish government has done, uh, but uh, extending beyond the OPT to certain types of occupations. Two, instruct public procurers to actively assess and proceed to exclude companies with such links. And three, require tendering companies to actively reveal such links uh, in the uh, uh, tendering process. Short of doing so, uh, states have really unwittingly exposed uh, uh, general publics, uh, but also public procurers to uh, involvement to support uh, um, serious rights abuses, uh, which include indeed domestic crimes. Uh, and, and most of all, as I understand Giovanni will elaborate, it has placed the burden on civil society to both expose the nature of, of such links by public service providers and, and to shield procurers, moreover, uh, who have taken exclusion decisions um, um, by politicizing the, the, legal, the legal safeguards in domestic and international law that I've just discussed. Um, thank you and apologies for, for going over time. Thanks a lot, Valentina, and no problem at all, of course. Uh, go ahead, Giovanni. Uh, I think should be, are you seeing, right? Okay. Uh, so, thank you very much for inviting me today. And yes, I uh, basically, I will... Uh, Thanks, um, Valentina, um, for your presentation. And let's say that now I will try to translate what Valentina explained uh, in, uh, in a concrete case where we, that we are currently working on here at VLC, which is the case of uh, EGGED uh, EBS. Um, so, Agged is the largest transportation company in Israel and, uh, has, uh, uh, and it has a subsidiary, uh, EBS, 
uh, which is a company we, uh, that operates in the Netherlands. So, um, uh, EBS and AGED are, uh, you know, are extremely involved uh, in the illegal Israeli settlements because they connect uh, all the settlements uh, between them and they connect the settlements with Israel. So in this, uh, in this case uh, that we developed together with the Rights Forum, we decided to challenge uh, EBS, uh, AGED participation in a public tender uh, in the Dutch municipalities of North Zandam, which is north of Amsterdam. And we decided to challenge uh, its, this participation because uh, EBS is uh, operative in the Netherlands, is participating in public tenders in, uh, in other uh, municipalities, and, uh, and, uh, and taking inspiration from the idea and the arguments that Valentina also described, uh, we try to uh, influence, to, yeah, to challenge uh, and uh, to do an advocacy work with the uh, municipality involved. And uh, uh, the idea, I mean, we basically we wrote a legal opinion and, uh, uh, and also a letter which was signed by Professor Marcel Brooks of the University of Groningen, uh, asking indeed the uh, competent authority to exclude Agged um, uh, from the tender. Uh, on the ground of the, uh, of the, of the fact that uh, indeed the uh, AGED um, uh, integrity is highly questionable due to its involvement in the uh, illegal Israeli settlements. So, uh, in developing our arguments, we, we, mm, we, we explain to the uh, competent authority uh, that uh, in uh, developing, in, in, uh, um, in the evaluation process, uh, should take into account two main elements. First of all, the gravity of the harmful impact that Agit is causing uh, in uh, uh, Palestine. And uh, our main, and, and we have an overwhelming, I would say, amount of evidence uh, on the fact that Agit facilitated uh, the movement of the settlers and it contributed to the maintenance and the expansion of the, settlement, of the, settlement, of the settlements. Um, and uh, this, uh, uh, and, and uh, we, we, we were able also to make this point very clear, also thanks to the UN database, uh, saying how, uh, uh, saying that indeed Agged is one of the company mentioned in the UN database. Uh, the second point, uh, we, we highlighted how, uh, even if EBS is a subsidiary, uh, is part uh, of the Agged group. So we ask to exclude the Agged, the Agged group as a whole. And so we explained that there was a, a strong uh, connection uh, between uh, the, the subsidiary company operating in the Netherlands and uh, the mother company uh, in, uh, in Israel. And one of the uh, um, evidence of this is the fact that in 2014, EBS was in bankruptcy and it was saved by the mother company in Israel, so which disproved a strong correlation and connection um, between uh, the two. So also EBS must be considered liable for the contribution to this harmful impact. And um, so after we, we sent this material to the competent authority, the competent authority uh, replied to us. Uh, they affirmed that they were taking into serious consideration our arguments, and actually they forwarded our legal memo to EBS, and now they are waiting for our reply. Uh, the point is that, of course, due to Corona, the tender procedure has been postponed, so most likely we will know something back, uh, I would say, maybe between uh, November or December, let's see. Uh, anyway, this... Uh, um, uh, at the current point, we are considering also following steps in this direction because uh, we believe uh, uh, there, there are a couple of strategies that can be uh, carried out. On the one side, uh, indeed, uh, it would make a lot of sense to keep, con uh, keep demanding competent Dutch authorities to exclude both EBS but also other companies uh, mentioned in the UN database from public tender procedures. So uh, to address uh, competent authorities like we did with EBS. And on the other side, to require uh, EU government to issue these guidelines 
clarifying, uh, clarifying that uh, public procurers, so uh, authorities that are issuing public tender, are on the one side permitted to exclude the companies that violate international human rights law, or at least uh, they should issue guidelines uh, um, clarifying that uh, uh, municipalities must take into account companies' compliance with human rights due diligence standard. Uh, because uh, also, uh, uh, so the fact that uh, um, municipalities should ask uh, um, companies to provide uh, proof and evidence of this human rights due diligence because we believe that, like in EBS case, those companies would not be able to do so. On the other side, uh, the idea is to try to challenge public authorities' decision uh, before uh, EU national uh, courts. But this aspect uh, uh, has uh, pro and, and cons, of course. Uh, and for concluding, very quickly, uh, I think that, of course, the, uh, the, the, the UN database uh, uh, gave a huge contribution for handling uh, corporate complicity. And of course, we have to thank uh, Al Haq and all the other organizations that, that carried out uh, such work in order to have the database published. And now, uh, there is another challenge, which is indeed to see how we can uh, translate the recommendation of the UN database in practice. And we hope that uh, uh, developing these arguments also in the field of public performance law uh, e uh, could be the, the right way uh, to achieve uh, accountability. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Giovanni, for providing a clear case to the words of uh, Valentina. Also, thanks a lot, Valentina. Um, I would like now like to open the floor for questions. So we already received a few questions, but feel free to add them in the chat. Uh, also, some articles and background info uh, was shared on the chat. Uh, by multiple panelists, so also feel free to look into that. Some are only in Dutch, sorry for that, uh, but there are also, uh, there's enough info also in English. Um, so the first question to all the speakers, I think, especially to Maha maybe, although the economic and other activities of the Israeli government in the occupied territories are clearly in violation of the Fort Geneva Convention, they are often not recognized as such because in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, there's no explicit reference to this Fort Geneva Convention. Um, so the, the participant who's asking the question says that this is a mistake that should be corrected. What is the opinion of the panelists about that? Uh, Maha, would you like to respond to that? Sure, Thomas, thank you. And thank you for uh, the question. I think that uh, the question touches on a very, very important issue that has been really lacking in the development of the business and human rights framework over the past uh, decade plus, and which is the lack of emphasis and elaboration on international humanitarian law and what that means when we're looking at uh, business uh, responsibilities within the framework of IHL specifically when they're on the ground carrying activities in conflict affected areas or situations of occupation like in the OPT. The UN guiding principles has been very reserved let's say in, uh, in its uh, in its outlook or in its reference of uh, international humanitarian law and uh, and uh, you know if you look uh, at the UN guiding principles there's only two references to uh, international humanitarian law throughout the whole document and uh, that's why there needs to be further interpretations on on what that means for both states when it comes to business activities that, uh, for, for businesses that come within their jurisdiction, but also for, um, for, for business enterprises and, uh, and what that means for them in, when, when operating in such contexts. When, when we're looking at the UN database specifically that I, uh, that I spoke uh, very long about uh, earlier, um, if we look at the original Human Rights Council resolution that mandates the creation of the UN database, here we see that there has been several explicit references to IHL specifically, including uh, the Geneva Conventions and so on. And there, there, maybe the three key references has been that uh, 
you know, business enterprises should respect IHL standards linking to violations associated to Israeli settlements. So again, uh, a further emphasis on IHL and what Israeli settlements constitute under IHL. And the resolution itself also emphasizes the need or importance for states to act in accordance with their national legislations, but also in compliance with IHL when it comes to business activities uh, in the OPT. And then the, the, there's another important thing in the resolution, which, which also looks at uh, or, or reminds states specifically uh, about Israel's obligations under IHL embodied in the Geneva Conventions, also as in relation to business activities in occupied territory. But as I said again uh, earlier, that you know the, the framework of business and human rights could definitely use more and more elaboration on IHL, not only as a framework, but also what it means uh, for corporate liability or for liability of corporate related human rights violations or environmental violations in situations of conflict and uh, occupation, what it means um, for, for access to justice for victims and affected communities and populations. And this is something that human rights organizations around the world has been uh, pushing forward, especially uh, or more recently so in the negotiations surrounding the UN uh, legally binding instrument on uh, business and human rights. And we see like organizations from all over the world that are pushing this uh, forward, the focus on IHL, on conflict areas and why, it, uh, why it's uh, unique, let's say in the application. I hope that answers the question. Thanks a lot, Maha. I believe, Valentina, you also want to add something? No? That very, very brief three three points, but not, not that elaborate. I completely agree with that. that that's a very comprehensive answer. Um, I was going to mention one to be clear. IHL is part of the Ruggy principles, right? We shouldn't forget that uh, when it speaks to human rights, uh, the UN guiding principles include IHL, but it is true, and that is why it is true, as Maha mentioned, that the conflict affected business environments have not received the necessary attention when it comes to implementation from states or indeed from international bodies. Um, including uh, the, the, these gaps are seen in, for instance, the absence of an enhanced due diligence uh, framework for certain business environments, um, which is something apparently that the working group on business and human rights is, is focusing on as we speak. Um, so, so there might be more guidance on that to come. Um, the other point I was going to make is that the database mandate is limited indeed, right? We, we have to remember that it, it, it in spite of our hopes that it would be elaborated in accordance with the um, instruments of BHR soft law, what we call RUGI or the, the UN guiding principles and so on, it, uh, it, its mandate, as Mahad mentioned, uh, is, is seen by the UN and states uh, as limited to the criteria in the original fact-finding mission report on, on uh, the settlements and, and perhaps even uh, less than that report was actually uh, mandated to, to report on. So um, we, should, we should consider, uh, and I'd be interested to hear indeed if there are any developments uh, that effect or any potential to that effect, uh, the extent to which RUGI and the database are compatible. Thanks a lot, Valentina, for the addition. Uh, next question came in for David. Um, what do you expect from the ruling next year? Very short. Well, we're crossing our fingers, um, uh, hoping, hoping for victory. I, I myself think that we've got a, a really strong case. I, I guess we'll, we'll see what we see. Um, I, I just want to, uh, you know, say something. I, I didn't. I didn't really put a fine point on that in my presentation. That the, the Trudeau government is is going to the wall to defend Israel's right, not only to import settlement products into Canada, but not only to waive tariffs. 
on settlement products, but to defend Israel's right, as I put it, to conceal the the criminal origin of its of its products from Canadian consumers. Canada is actually defending Israel's right to label its settlement products as products of Israel. This is a tantamount to endorsing annexation, and I I just don't think that that the Canadian government's going to succeed. Thanks, David, for the addition. Also, kind of linking to the annexation, the next question came by one of the participants. With regards to the increased threat by Israeli government to officially annex the settlements, do you foresee that authoritative bodies and other stakeholders reassess and review that their authoritative analysis and statements, especially with respect to the current expectation for companies to carry out enhanced human rights due diligence, but not explicitly saying that they should not consider involvement in settlement activities. In other words, enhanced human rights due diligence in itself does not equal responsible business conduct aligned with global norms, nor does it absolve companies from their human rights to respect human rights, their responsibility to respect human rights. Is there someone who would like to respond to that? I see Maha nodding. I'm just uh, very pleased to see that the link between uh, annexation and uh, settle uh, and and settlement business or the settlement economy being brought into this discussion because it's often uh, not the case and the two for some reason are seen completely separately like business uh, involvement in in settlement advancing settlement again making uh, occupation more permanent i.e which could translate into annexation of occupied territory and so on and um, I, uh, I i would leave the floor for my colleagues to also contribute to the answer but i think ideally this is something that we would uh, push for you know that this is the the chance not as a sanction or not as a punishment but this is a chance or an incentive for governments and the international community to correct their maybe long overdue or long due uh, um, uh, flaws or faults of not implementing their obligations or adhering to their obligations under international law, including regulating the the um, or, or 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 regulating and providing more guidance to businesses operating uh, in the OPT and so on. So hopefully that it would it would be like a, a good trigger for for uh, states like the Netherlands, but also other European states to uh, impose more mandatory uh, human rights due diligence for companies that are operating or linked to uh, Israeli settlement. Thanks, Maha. Any other of the panelists who would like to add to that answer? Giovanni, would you like to say something of Valentina? I think Shimaha already said uh, everything, so it's difficult to add to something because uh, she covered the, uh, the, the, the question very well, so no. Thanks. I can add that uh, that uh, annexation, right, I mean, this is, the, these are, these are basics, but of course, annexation in in its de facto form is very much already there. That is that is the nature of um, uh, both it, Israel's um, occupation, uh, unlawful occupation, unlawful presence in occupied territory, uh, given its underlying uh, sovereign claim to the territory through through annexation. In other situations of occupation. Um, it is a claim to permanently uh, displace the rightful sovereign. Right? But the transformation of the laws and institutions of the occupied territory are very much underway and have been underway from, from even before the first day of the occupation in the case of the OPT, as we know. Um, but what, what is, uh, not, to, not to sidetrack into a discussion of what changes were annexation, uh, too much, but the economic integration that will be enabled through the formal extension of Israeli domestic law to um, the areas of the West Bank that it will cover, right, and, and we can assume area C, uh, so-called, uh, primarily uh, will make that um, 
real, the reality in which businesses, Israeli businesses registered in Israel um, could no longer really, it would, it would make distinction impossible, even more impossible than, uh, than it is already, as, as Pauline noted, in relation to, to trade links um, and so on. Um, but one, one further point, perhaps, is that uh, in relation to procurement, uh, if you will, the response, the, the package of sanctions in response to Crimea, which included a, a range of proactive top-down measures to restrict business links, affecting all, all uh, kinds of sectors, investment and, and so on, uh, was based on the gravity of the annexation and the aggression that, that it was understood to represent uh, because it was so outward, right? So th this is just to, to hint at the possibility that if it is outward, and we know that, that, the, um, that the, the framing has been made less explicit by, by Israeli government uh, statements or what is predicted to happen. But that explicitness, even if disguised, might bring us to, to a situation of perhaps a political decision, although it's not likely, but clearly an understanding that certain bright line rules will have to be drawn, um, like uh, uh, those concerning the economy. Uh, so I, I think there, there is definitely uh, something there that will change beyond what, what is uh, uh, what is the response of third states uh, and third party actors today? Thanks a lot, Valentina, Asuma, and Giovanni for answering this question. Uh, a question came in especially for Giovanni and for Maha. Uh, could you say something about the role of pro Israeli lobbyists impeding the legal processes? Would you like to start, Maha or Giovanni? Giovanni, go ahead. Yeah, but well, uh, um, I I think that uh, I think we, we can see there are uh, 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 there are two uh, yeah I mean how how the, the the lobby works in this case but from my point of view what we are seeing uh, is that there is a very important attempt to describe and no, sorry to address and to create a narrative around what we are doing now as something in, in extremely like bad as something uh, uh, that uh, threat uh, the Israel uh, existence. So there, um, I would say that there are two two layers. On the one side, we, we are creating to create this narrative for the general public by connecting uh, again an accusation of anti-Semitism to uh, advocacy or human rights advocacy okay uh, and this is uh, goes to the uh, this is the, the, the general public layer and then on the other side we have uh, uh, also the, the, the legal uh, field where we have many pro-Israel uh, lawfare organization who are constantly targeting and uh, use legal legal tools for uh, 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 um, uh, for attacking uh, human rights organization in Palestine and in Europe. So 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 I think this is uh, let's say uh, I mean uh, this uh, tell us that uh, on the other side there is they are quite afraid of, of, of advancing human rights in such a way. Uh, that's the reason why. Uh, they are using this kind of, uh, of, of, of tools. But uh, so, yes, I, I see lobby activities in, this, uh, in these two layers. And indeed, this uh, is uh, coming also a problem because um, organizations, NGOs, organizations, academics, people become, they, they are becoming a bit more afraid to speak out because they don't want to be attacked. They don't want to be smeared. So, so the idea in general is to make Palestine, you know, a kind of toxic issue in the public debate. So people will be uh, deterred from, from into a discussion and, and advocate for uh, accountability and respect of human rights.
Yeah, I completely agree with uh, Giovanni's uh, analysis and the tools that he uh, presented, especially with the attacks, increasing attacks against uh, individuals, organizations, but also international institutions like the ICC, the Human Rights Council, the United Nations Human Rights Council, for, uh, for the work that's been carried out in terms of analyzing the law, international law, and in the pursuit of accountability. And uh, from this as well, I mean, the issue of uh, how much these organizations or lobby groups have, uh, have managed to deviate from international law, but also undermine international law and uh, human rights standards and manipulate it for the benefit of advancing one, uh, one unilateral uh, extreme narrative uh, on, beha you know, on, on, uh, on behalf of another and uh, so on and maybe i could give like one concrete example from the from the from the experience of the un database itself and uh, that was in two in uh, in march 2019 and uh, a few days maybe a day or two later after the un high commissioner released a letter saying that it will once again delay the the release of the un database the world jewish congress from new york issued a press release welcoming the postponement of the un human uh, of the un database which it of course calls as a blacklist and urged the council to cancel the report in its entirety the World Jewish Congress had uh, in, the, in this press release uh, also inserted a picture of uh, one of their uh, directors or leaders meet in a meeting with the, with the High Commissioner at, at, b right before she announced the, the postponement of the, of, the, of the release of the database. And of course, while there will be no explicit words saying, you know, the, the, the World Jewish Congress or any other pro-Israeli lobby groups have exerted any threats or pressure against the, 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 the office of the High Commissioner and the High Commissioner herself about this database, but I think one can do the, the calculation and the equation. Thanks a lot, Maha. Maybe it's also interesting to extend this question to you, David. Did you face any issues? Well, I mean, for me, it's astonishing that it took, uh, you know, I actually came up with a spreadsheet uh, with all the documents that I've gotten, emails. I compiled all the email addresses and names of all the Canadian government officials and individuals, staff from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the Wicca Control Board of Ontario and various other departments who were engaged in sorting through the, arriving at the initial decision to declare product of Israel labels um, um, in non-compliance with Canadian law. There are hundreds of them, hundreds of them spent five and a half months determining that uh, product of Israel labels were non-compliant. It was not. It was not a political decision. It was. It was a decision based on regulation and law, uh, consumer protection law, um, and it took the Israeli lobby, the pro-Israel lobby, took them forty-eight hours to have the decision reversed. And really, in reality, it took really the better part of a business day to reverse a decision that had been reached um, over a course of five and a half months. And so, you know, it just, it just I think, illustrates the awesome, awesome powers of, of the pro-Israel lobby to, uh, to undermine the rule of law. And, um, but I, I take great comfort in, in, in looking at the work of courts you know, the Federal Court of Canada came to the correct decision. And we see similar, similar decisions having been made by the European Court of Justice in regard to this French case involving Sago Winery. And we see the European Court of Human Rights has just come up with a, a very similar ruling in favor of um, pro-BDS activists in France. So courts, um, I, I place a lot of trust and faith in, in, in the legal system and in courts. But governments, 
will, I don't want to say always bends to the Israel lobby, but um, they often do. Thank you, David, for also sharing your insights into this. Another question came in from Maha. You mentioned that the UN database does not include all businesses. Why are some not included? Uh, originally, there was a list of more than 200 businesses. What is the reason that some were not included in the final list? Could you shed some light on that? I, I could definitely. Um, so I, I think initially uh, the, the Office of the High Commissioner started with about 307 companies being on the, on the list uh, for them to uh, examine and see. But I think it also, like the reason why, why the number has declined, I think is twofold. One goes back to the point that Valentina has mentioned earlier, which is the, the, the methodology process or uh, the criteria and the, and, and the limited, um, the limited uh, uh, scope or the limited, uh, sorry, I'm losing the word now, but the limited uh, mandate of it when looking at specific activities that are relevant to illegal Israeli settlements. So I think that's why in, like, we did not anticipate to have all companies complicit or involved in Israel's occupation be considered for this database. But anyway, in uh, February 2018, there was a report by the Office of the High Commissioner on this specific issue on the methodology and uh, how they consulted with the working group, for example, and uh, of the working group on business and human rights at the UN on, on the methodology and what kind of applicable standards have been set as uh, standards of proof for the potential inclusion of uh, certain companies uh, in, in the UN database, so whether there are reasonable grounds to believe that a company is engaged in uh, one of the listed activities that were uh, listed in the resolution or, uh, or not, or, or um, what are, what, what, uh, and they also considered, of course, the adverse impacts on, uh, on human rights of Palestinians. So those are all elements that played into filtering out, let's say, of, of companies from 307 to then, ex you know, throughout the, the process to excluding more and more companies to 206 companies at one point, and then now for them to be 112 companies publicly released. And uh, I think um, it's, uh, it's, it's also like important to note that in the process that civil society organizations like al haq for example, and I'm sure others in uh, Palestine and Europe and elsewhere, they have sent uh, uh, substantive submissions to the Office of the High Commissioner on a specific issue with a long, long, long list of uh, companies and uh, corporations that are involved and directly uh, or indirectly contributing to human rights violations and uh, grave breaches of international law in Israel's uh, settlement enterprise. And uh, still, even if uh, despite like the, the justifications of, uh, of the standard of proof and the limited scope, etc., I think the, the, the database still failed to include some of the major companies and uh, including multinationals like Heidelberg Cement, who are so explicitly uh, involved in this uh, settlement enterprise and contributing to it as has been evidenced throughout the past 13 years of its operations and activities in the occupied West Bank. So this is very, very unfortunate. But at the same time, this is why we as civil society need to keep the push for the annual update of the database because there are other companies that should be on that list and that should be considered, that should be um, um, engaged with to to uh, to reconsider their activities to terminate their activities and services in the, in the occupied palestinian territory thanks maha clear answer i think uh, i think we will round up soon so if people still want to ask questions this is the moment to do so uh, one more question came in for all the uh, panelists what can the public do to support if they want to do something Good question, right? So anyone would like to, to start? 
Yeah, maybe I, I can, but well, there are many, in many ways, uh, I would say, because first of all, we have to remember this is a civil society work, uh, civil society organization. So on the one side, sustain this organization and sustain, for example, in case of David, is doing a crowdfunding campaign, a uh, kind of active uh, uh, contribution. I think it's very welcomed, first of all. Uh, so yes, first of this, uh, I would say, and, uh, and then to, to the second, the second uh, thing would be uh, to keep speaking out, to keep speaking out about these uh, topics, to, to keep asking for justice and to don't uh, be intimidated. That's in my opinion, one of the most important thing uh, that uh, individually everyone, uh, everyone can, uh, can do. And perhaps building on Giovanni's last point about speaking out, I think it's also uh, very important to direct the speaking out towards local parliamentarians, the regional parliamentarians and other representatives to the governments, to the ministries of foreign affairs that are often uh, relevant to, uh, to, to making decisions and uh, answers on, on these issues, but also other ministries like the ministries of justice, trade, etc. I think um, when it comes to, uh, to that, uh, in, in Europe especially, the, the, the citizen's voice is heard and has made a lot of difference in, in, uh, in parliaments, in decision making and so on. So we count on, um, on, on, uh, on your voices to, be, to push forward uh, accountability and justice. Yeah, taking inspiration for one second what Maha said, indeed, uh, in the Netherlands, so when you, if you are the citizens and you are aware that your own municipality is, is uh, issuing public tenders and there are companies who are involved in the settlements, uh, please let us know. <laughs> and uh, because we noticed that here, at least in the Netherlands, uh, municipalities and local councils take into serious account the, the, com the complaints and the concerns raised by citizens. Uh, so, so it's always possible to build a coalition of uh, uh, citizens uh, concerned of um, human rights compliance uh, in its own uh, town or city. So this is absolutely possible. And if you are a consumer, uh, when you go into a, a wine store and you spot a bottle of wine that was produced in the Golan Heights, and it's labeled product of Israel, tell the wine store manager that it concerns you if you spot a, a little tub of hummus or figs or dates or cosmetic products or any of these kinds of consumer products that are labeled product of Israel. And you know that they were produced within an unlawful Jewish settlement in the West Bank. Um, tell the store manager and uh, it's sometimes good to have a little, a little document in your pocket, you know, some kind of statement or, you know, legal ruling that states that settlements are illegal. Um, you know, the more, more specific the document is, the better. And, and give, it, give it to the store manager and say, you know, you're marketing a product that's falsely labeled and it's produced under conditions that violate international humanitarian and human rights law. Um, I think you should remove it from your store shelf. Something consumers can do. Thanks, David, and also Giovanni and Maha for the answers. Um, I think that's a good ending of this webinar. Um, thank you all for joining, uh, participants, but also the speakers for taking the time. Uh, and as I said, this recording will be published, uh, so we will send you the link if you registered, uh, that you will receive the. Um, the link to the webinar to the recording and we will leave the chat open for a few more minutes in case there are questions or you want to share some large thoughts feel free to go ahead and also warmly welcome you to to check out the websites and the documents that have been provided in the chat um, and enjoy your day have a nice day to come nice evening depending on where you are and hope to see you again thank you bye thank you thomas thank you and all speakers. Thank you, Thomas, and all the speakers.